Corey Peacock holds a PhD in Hebrew and Judaic studies from New York University. He specializes in the history, languages, and literature of the ancient Near East, focusing on Israel and Judah. In his work, Corey strives to make the Hebrew Bible accessible to non-specialists and has a heart for underserved populations. Corey also is a founding member of the Sonoran Theological Group, and I want him to tell you a little bit about that here in Phoenix. And in his limited spare time, he enjoys board games, playing his ukulele, and spending as much time as possible with his three children. And he's going to uh, help us today continue the Atheist for Jesus Lent series by helping us understand who Jesus was and his cultural context. So let's put our hands together and give a warm welcome to Corey Peacock. Come on, man. Good morning. Uh, so I was actually going to go to Florida as well, but there was a quota on how much awesome could come from Arizona, and Ryan took up most of that quota. So um, instead, I stayed with my three children. Um, I have a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a one-and-a-half-year-old, so we're busy. Um, I love my kids. They take up a lot of my attention, as you might imagine. Uh, and that's the thing I like to identify with first is I'm a dad. Um, but I also am uh, one of the founding members of the Sonoran Theological Group. And one of the things we uh, strive to do here, we are building a seminary and center for theological education here in the Valley because we feel like Phoenix is underserved. And one of the things we want to do is not just prepare pastors, which is important. It's absolutely important. But there are a lot of people who are in ministry who don't do it full time, who need some support and help and guidance. And then there are the rest of us who just want to know a little bit more than we hear in Sunday school sometimes. Sunday school piques our interest, and we just want to know a little bit more about that. And uh, you can't always get that at the local seminaries due to a lot of things, but we want to be able to serve that population as well. So that's the Sonoran Theological Group. We're fairly new, but we're trying to get out there, meet people, and, and support uh, Phoenix and the entire area so that we can have a city changed for God. Um, so, I recently heard a story in a sermon that was so good I just have to share it. So I'm going to tell you a story that I just heard recently. It's about the greatest home run hitter that ever lived, Frank Home Run Baker. That doesn't ring a bell with you? No? No. 1908 to 1922, Philadelphia A's, New York Yankees. No, this is not, No. Okay, it's not really about him. Um, it's about Hank Aaron, okay? So the pastor who told this story um, got, had the opportunity to meet Maury Wills, 1962 Los Angeles Dodgers uh, National League MVP. And Maury Wills told the pastor this story. So now, like, we're on third generation of hearing this story. Okay, so there was this game. And it's near the end of the season, Hank Aaron is coming to the plate in that classic situation while he's playing for the Milwaukee Braves. Bottom of the ninth, down by three, and uh, bases loaded, and you have the greatest hitter, home run hitter of all time. Time, time, time. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> and so, as the situation goes, he's standing at the plate, and Yogi Berra's behind the plate, and he's the greatest trash talker of all time, and he's getting, trying to get in Hank Aaron's ear, and he's like, all right, boys, come on in, weak stick, he can't do anything, and at the same time, he's also yammering, just going on and on to Hank, right? Ah, oh, Hank, you can't hit his slider, You've, you can't touch him, just put, pack it in, buddy, we're done, right? So, of course, you know, as this story goes, it has to go full count. Three, three balls, two strikes. And it's supposed to be this game where this pitch now decides it. You score the run, you, you win the game, you win, you move on in the playoffs, you lose, you go home. Win, go on, lose, stay, uh, go home. And the pastor who was telling this was telling it to an African-American congregation. So, of course, he stayed on that point for about 15 minutes, right? And he would get some uh, participation. He would say, win, and everyone would say, go on. And he would say, lose, and everyone would say, go home, right? Win, go on, lose, go home. Focusing on this point over and over and over. He told it in about 15 minutes. I'll tell it in about three. Um, so there, Hank Aaron is at the plate. 
And it's three and two, and here comes the pitch. He's about ready. Hank Aaron's standing up there. He gets there. And right as the pitch is about to come, Yogi Berra looks up at Hank Aaron and he says, Hank, the writing's upside down. Now, if you've ever played baseball and held a wooden bat, tried to swing the bat, the thing is, the bat, when you hold it out, right, the label's supposed to face up because of the way the grain of the wood goes. Because if you hit that ball and, that, and the label isn't up, it's going to shatter the bat and it's going to hurt your hands and it's not going to go as far as it should. So Barra says, the writing's upside down. He's trying to distract him, get him to read that label and divide his attention. Hank Aaron's having none of it. Ball comes in, crushes it over the second baseman, over right center field, over the fence, home run, trots around the bases, lands at home, everyone mobs him. Yay, we won, we're going on, all this stuff. Hank Aaron starts walking off, Yogi Berra's standing there with his, you know, head in his hands like, uh, you know, like I had nothing, I got nothing. And Hank turns back and says, hey, Yogi, I didn't come here to read. Right? So this is one of those things where everybody who's hearing this story when this uh, pastor is telling the story, he says, there are these moments in our lives. Are we there to hit a home run or are we there to read the label on the bat? And everyone's just like, yes, oh, I love God, right? I'm ready for those moments. It's an amazing story. The problem is it's not true. Well, it didn't happen. About two minutes into the story, I turned to my wife and I went, didn't happen. Not because I'm a cynic, but because I love baseball, right? Hank Aaron played for the National League. Yogi Berra played for the American League. And until about 15, 20 years ago, they never played against each other. Well, okay, Yogi Berra did play for the Mets in 1965, and they played in four games against each other. And in fact, Yogi Berra's very last game, they played against each other. But that was in May, so it wasn't a significant game. Okay, so how about All-Star games? They did play in about seven or eight All-Star games together, but Hank Aaron never hit a home run in those games. Not one. He hit a home run in 1971, but Yogi Berra had been retired for six years. What about World Series? Well, actually, Milwaukee and the New York Yankees played against each other in 1957 and 1958, but in 1958, Hank Aaron hit no home runs. And in 1957, he hit three. One in the bottom of the fourth inning in game three, one in the bottom of the fifth inning in game four. Fascinating enough, Eddie Matthews hit a game-winning home run in the bottom of the 10th, and he hit a home run in the top of the seventh. I guess all I'm trying to say here is like the, the details never match up. There was never a case where Hank Aaron's at the plate in the bottom of the ninth with Yogi Berra behind the plate when he hits a game winning grand slam. Hank Aaron did hit 16 grand slams and nine walk-off home runs and one of those home runs was a grand slam. But that was in July 12th, 1965 against Lindy McDaniel of the St. Louis Cardinals. Right, it doesn't match up. So none of this works, but it was a great story. Well, it was a fantastic story. So if the details don't matter, in that case, if the de details don't line up, that is, can it be true? Can that story be true even if those details don't matter at all? Well, Maury Wills didn't make that story up out of whole cloth. Maybe he thought he had forgotten that he was thinking of Stan Musial, who in 1955 hit a home run in the All-Star game in the bottom of the ninth except for Stan Musial's white and left-handed and Hank Aaron's right-handed and black. Um, so maybe not. Maybe he forgot the details. Maybe it wasn't the bottom of the ninth. Maybe the full count wasn't full. Maybe the bases weren't loaded. So kind of my question really comes down to, can it be true even if all those things didn't happen? I think maybe somebody said such a thing. Hey, I didn't come here to read, but it got attributed to the wrong person. Okay, so maybe that happened. Memory is a tricky thing. So, in the last several years, New York University has been doing this study, reporting on our memories of 9-11. What they did was, right after 9-11 happened, they interviewed about 2,000 people. And then they interviewed them again at a one-year time lapse, and at a three-year time lapse, and at a 10-year time lapse. 
And what they found is that almost 40% of us misremember in a significant way in something they call a time slice, uh, splice error. That is, you remember the details, but you kind of forget where everything and how it goes together. You know, um, one man remembered being on the street when he heard the news of 9-11, but he had said a couple years before that actually he was in his office and his memory had blurred with time. So the, the leader of the study said this, once people have come up with an inaccurate but coherent narrative, they often stick with it, the study finds. You begin to weave a very coherent story, and when you have a structured, coherent story, it's retained for a very long period of time. But our poor personal memories are also augmented by the media that kept telling us all the details. So we remember certain details, but we might remember our own, misremember our own personal details. Memory is a tricky thing. It's a funny thing. This may also explain a little bit of why Brian Williams had a problem recently with the details that were related to him versus what happened to the entire uh, convoy that he was traveling with. So this happens at a personal level, but there's no way this could happen at the communal level, right? I mean, the multiplicity of our memories and checking against one another, that would keep us on track, wouldn't it? That would keep us accurate, right? Well, our country's founders were always and only concerned with the equality of all men, right? The Civil War was always and only about slavery, and alcoholism has always been understood as a disease. This is true, right? N no, not at all, right? The founders thought many different things, but one thing they thought was that rich, white, landed men should run the country. And the Civil War was as much about st slave rights until Lincoln changed the narrative. And alcoholism, well, as recently as the 1950s, it was seen as a moral wrong, sign of a lazy person, a sin. In fact, I like to call it the sin du jour. We're so worried about today's sin du jour, and we forget how quick we were to label alcoholics as the most sinful people in the room. Communal memory is as much about what we as a society forget as it is about what we remember. Let me say that again because it's important. Communal memory is as much about what we for, uh, as a society forget as it is about what we remember. That's not good or bad, it just is. So how does this relate to the Bible? Let's look at Judges 5. Judges 5 is one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible. In fact, I've often said I could teach an entire year's worth of material on this one chapter because there, it is so rich. One of the reasons it is so rich is because it's probably the oldest thing that we have from the Bible, the oldest written thing. Okay, So nothing was probably written before it that got retained in its current form. Um, so... We jump right into this story, and this is probably about how the, a Canaanite king uh, and community were limiting the trade of the Israelites. So uh, Deborah and Barak, not Obama, um, mustered the tribes of Israel to come and fix the problem. So this section where we're going to start uh, praises and condemns the tribes based on their response to the situation. So... I'll read it off the screen to make sure we have the same version, right? The remnant of the nobles came down. The people of the Lord came down to me against the mighty. Some came from Ephraim, whose roots were in Amalek. Benjamin was with the people who followed you. From Mehir, captains came down. From Zebulun, those who bear a commander's staff. The princes of Issachar were with Deborah. <clears throat> yes, Issachar was with Barak, sent under his command into the valley. In the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Why did you say, stay among the sheep pens to hear the whistling for the flocks? In the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And Dan, why did he linger, beyond, uh, linger by the ships? Asher remained on the coast and stayed in his coves. The people of Zebulun risked their very lives. 
So did Naphtali on the terraced fields. Kings came, they fought, the kings of Canaan fought at Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no plunder of silver. From the heavens, the stars fought. From their courses, they fought against Sisera. The river Kishon swept them away, the age-old river, the river Kishon. March on my soul, be strong. Then thundered the horse's hooves, galloping, galloping go his mighty seas. Curse, Moroz, said the angel of the Lord. Lord, curse its people bitterly, because they did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord against the mighty. What a happy scripture. <clears throat> Pardon me, sorry. So what do we notice in this passage? Who's mentioned? Well, we have Reuben and Dan and Naphtali and Gilead and Asher and Issachar and Zebulun and Ephraim and Benjamin and Mahir and Moroz. If you've read your Bible, you might remember we're missing Simeon and Levi and Judah and Manasseh. Where are they? Okay, let's, we'll hold that for a second. A second thing. Membership in Israel was not about a genetic relationship. Who is Mahir? Some think it may be Manasseh, but that link is really too tenuous. It looks like a separate tribe that has nothing to do with Israel before or after. The best explanation of early Israel and their political coming together uh, that fits within the cultural and communal context of the ancient Near East is that they were this loose coalition of peoples that held things in common, like political organization and the worship of Yahweh. But they were not biologically related, per se. They didn't come from one family. I'm going to put that on hold for one second. We'll tie it up in one more point. And what's the third point? Responding to this muster, Deborah and Barak said, hey, everybody, come fight with me. It was a muster. It was voluntary. Some came. Some did not. Yet, this was not a decision without consequences. Some were praised, some were condemned, and some were cursed. So why the different responses? The consensus seems to be that the story is about responding to a muster to respond to a trade uh, issues. Very sexy, I know, right? It's what we all want to read about, trade embargoes, fighting those for the Lord. Okay, so for those tribes who were close by, they were really supposed to go. Reuben's lack of participation seems to be grudgingly accepted because he's far enough away. Reuben, why'd you stay way over there? We kind of needed you. Well, then <clears throat> Gilead and Dan receive a little more chastisement because they were closer, but still perhaps far enough away to have like a legitimate excuse. You stayed in your coves. You should have come and been with us and fought Sisera and the Canaanites. We needed you. Who is poor Moroz? Moroz was close enough that they absolutely should have been there. They absolutely should have been in this fight because it mattered to them and it mattered to the larger group of people who, who was uh, participating in this. So when Moroz is called to muster and they don't, well, if you're here and you're not for us, then you're out of the club. Not just out, they're cursed. They're completely kicked out of the club. Israel may be a little bitter here, a little bit like, I'm going to break up with you before you break up with me kind of thing. So get out. So that means here that Israel looked different before and after this event. Israel's constituency was somewhat fluid in its early days. Some tribes came in, some stayed, and some left. So let's talk about those 12 tribes of Israel. We've got another slide here. If you look at all the tribes of Israel, every time they are listed in the Bible, every column here represents a listing of all the tribes of Israel. The red shows the differences to other lists. 
there are no two lists that are the same. No two lists in the Bible are exactly the same. Whether that means the order, whether it means the ones who actually make it up or not. So as a reminder, Judges 5 is one of the oldest passages in the Bible, likely written around 1100 BCE. 500 years later, when Genesis is written, the metaphor for explaining how the world is situated now is family. You can see, for instance, in our next slide, in Genesis 10, and if you read Genesis 10, the whole thing, the whole world is described as family. What you have is you've got Assyria and Babylon in the east, and they're distant cousins. And Mitzrayim is a distant cousin on the west. And then you have Moab and Edom, who are closer cousins, and they're situated geographically closer. And Israel now are brothers. This is the metaphor they use to explain how the world is situated. And this is not weird or uncommon. It's not strange. In many Asian and African communities, anyone older than you in the community is known as auntie or uncle. Or older brother, uh, um, children that are older than you might be older brother, or younger than you might be little sister. This is a metaphor that is very powerful. I've already mentioned one metaphor that we as Americans still use, the founding fathers. This is not a strange metaphor. But hundreds of years after Israel had come together politically and religiously, the metaphor of family, the story that they had forgotten about the early fluidity, that was forgotten and this metaphor became considered to be fact. And that's why we get the story of Israel and his 12 sons as the tribes of Israel. So right about this time when Genesis is written, in the history books of the Bible, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, the story of Israel's history and movement into exile, and their explanation for this detail was a lack of fidelity to Yahweh. Why did we go into exile? Because we weren't faithful to God. That story is being told at the same time that they're starting to forget the fluidity, fluidity of early Israel. The reason we went into exile was we followed the foreign gods and didn't worship Yahweh alone. But when the Israelites returned from exile, Ezra and Nehemiah encouraged, and by encouraged I mean compelled, the Israelites to put away their foreign wives. The Israelites, and now the story for the Israelites wasn't about a lack of fidelity to Yahweh in its community, but it was about communal demographics. The problem used to be our inappropriate worship of the foreign gods. Now it's just the foreigners. This fact of family relatedness became the mark of right relationship to God, and it allowed the Jews to view others as the problem, not their own relationship to God. What had been about worshiping Yahweh right, well, and only became about being a homogenous community. Israel had forgotten who they had been, fluid in their nature. And they engaged in an act of communal forgetting. And in this case, not for the good. They became an exclusive club, what's known as a bounded set. The marker of their identity, that is, heritage in one of the tribes of Israel became the thing that determined whether you were on the inside and therefore acceptable or on the outside and therefore to be rejected. This is the world into which God sent his son, Jesus. So let's look at an episode from Jesus' life. Matthew 15, verses 21 to 28. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word, so his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. The version I um, did my study on said, She keeps yelling at us. Make her stop. 
He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Well, I think perhaps you might have the same impression I have of Jesus at that moment. What a jerk. (laughs) Well, maybe. The question I have when I read this Is this Jesus' real opinion of non-Jews at that moment? I mean, is this a legitimate, like, accurate recording of how he felt? Does that resonate with the God who was constantly including more people in his circle? Maybe. Is Jesus just testing her, and he wants to see how much she wants it? That is actually a very common way of understanding this passage. He's not anti-Jew, anti-non-Jew, anti-Gentile. He just needs to make sure she really knows what she is asking, knows who she's coming to. Is this Matthew, the most Jewish of all the gospel writers? Is he tipping his hand about how he feels about Gentiles? I'm Jewish. I can't believe this woman came, but I'll tell the story because I'm supposed to. There are other possibilities. What if Matthew is actually setting up this story here to show the cultural value that the Jews have in order to show how Jesus subverts it? The great commission to make disciples of all nations is in Matthew, after all. So now this story is also found in Mark, but it doesn't have the same bite to it that the Matthew passage does. So, for instance, uh, Matthew uses that word dogs, pests. They are, these are not like your family pet. Mark uses a word that was more like puppies, your family pet, <laughs> right? It's just a little softer, and the whole exchange is, is a lot softer. There's just not that, oh, to it. That's a technical term. Um, The other thing, too, is here, Jesus says, I only came to serve Israel. Whereas in Mark, Mark says, I came to serve Israel first, and the Gentiles after. So there's something different going on in the story in Matthew, and there is that push that makes it feel like, what's going on here? It is in this Matthew passage, according to a commentator, James Still, that, here's a quote, Jesus is portrayed within the context of the Jewish understanding of purity since he regards the Gentile woman as unclean. Despite this, we learn that the wisdom teacher was not above appreciating the cleverness of others, even if they are women. End quote. You hear that? The commentator thinks that Jesus says she's unclean to Jesus, again, according to the commentator, because she's not Jewish. And the cure is due to her cleverness, not her faith. What has this commentator done to Jesus? I'm not sure I understand. Jesus excludes based on demographics and heals due to cleverness? This is not resonating with the the Bible that I'm reading. Where is the Jesus who encounters the centurion? and heals him with no compunction about him being a Gentile. Where is the Jesus who encounters the Samaritan woman and offers her living waters? Where's the Jesus who tells his followers, go and make disciples of all nations? See, Jesus is subverting the cultural norm of inclusion by birth and exclusion, or exclusion by birth, right? and no inclusion whatsoever. He's subverting this, and he's bringing more and more people to the table, people that nobody thought should be there. 
I'm not denying what the text says, says here. Jesus does seem reluctant to deal with this non-Jewish woman at first, but other passages like the ones I just mentioned show no such reluctance in Jesus to deal with Gentiles. And there's enough depth in this passage to make me pause before suggesting that he simply didn't like Gentiles and, well, he, okay, she's clever, I'll hail her. I don't think it's that simple. I think the general tendency we see in Jesus and throughout the New Testament is ever wider inclusion, allowing ever more participation in God's kingdom. Jesus calls fishermen to be his disciples, not the religious elite. He's friends with women, not just men, as it would have been culturally acceptable in that day. He's friends with the poor. He engages the sick. At every point, he's pushing that boundary of inclusion in a way that others would not. Now, that doesn't mean he just left everybody where they were. He called them to more and greater things. But it started with his engagement and inclusion of others. Think, too, about Jesus' parables. Those who attain heaven in those parables are the ones who go after it, not the ones that are born to it. I sold my field so I could, I, I sold everything I had so I could go buy the field where the treasure was buried. Right? That's the story Jesus tells. Israel had forgotten who they had been in their early history, not based on biological relations, but on faith in Yahweh. That's what they believed in the beginning. By Jesus' time, they had fixated on the metaphor that had become a fact, we are family and therefore we are the only ones to be in this club. Jesus was undermining that cultural memory and reinstituting inclusion. And this sets up an opportunity of inclusion for us. We too can get fixated on determining who is on the inside and who is on the outside. But Jesus calls us to more. This is about seeing a community of faith not as exclusive bounded set, but as an inclusive centered set. We've got one more slide here. Exclusive bounded sets are about that defining characteristic that defines whether you're on the inside of this circle or on the outside of this circle. How do you feel about baptism? You feel the right way, quote, right way, you're on the inside. The wrong way, you're on the outside. How do you do t um, communion? Is this transubstantiation? Is this consubstantiation? Is it metaphorical? What is it? You're on the inside, you're on the outside. Or there's the inclusive centered set which says, there's something that unites us, and what matters is your direction towards that or against that. Are you coming towards Jesus, or are you walking away from Jesus? The exclusive bounded set fosters an attitude that says, you belong because you look like me, you talk like me, you believe like me. You're clean, you're respectful. You hold the right views politically, you sing the right songs in church, and you're nice. Everyone else, well, heaven help them. The inclusive centered set fosters an attitude that says, you make me uncomfortable, whether it's because of your skin color or your political views or your orientation or your disability or your criminal record or your tattered clothes and tats and piercings, but you're made in the image of God and you're drawn to Jesus, so that makes you better and it makes me better. So let's figure this God thing out together. So what? What do we do with this? Where in your life do you find it hard to include others? Is it because of them? Is it because of you? Where do you draw your lines? Who is in and who is out? And I don't just mean the big questions. Are we going to allow people of different skin colors or ability of bodily ability or orientation? But it's when somebody who even looks like you walks through the door, do you shake their hand and welcome them? Are you inclusive? Are you not, are you not inclusive? Do you see the image of God in the people you meet? Communal memory is as much about what we forget as what we remember. One day I think the church will forget, in a good way, how poorly we treated people with dark skin and alcoholics 
in the LGBTQ community and the people who just thought different political views than us. Because we will have heard and remembered Jesus' message of inclusion. How he challenged our assumptions about who is in and who is out. And we learned that who is in is always a little wider set of people than we're currently comfortable with. Thank you.